So, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Heberling. I'm the Executive Director of Frontline Arts. And we're so grateful to have you here tonight at the Newark Public Library for this talk. So we are here on the ancestral homelands of Lenape Hopi, the Muncie and Manami, the Nanticoke, Powhat, and Ramapo nations. But land acknowledgement is not enough. We are still here. We must fight for the continued recognition and give the land back and engage in reciprocity and to stand against the colonial genocide of indigenous peoples across the world. So it's really wonderful and full circle to have Amos back 
right here 15 years later tonight. So, with this magical last minute grant, we've been printing for three days in our studio in Branchburg with folks traveling from all across the state and beyond, including Lenape tribal members from Pennsylvania. Now let's hear Amos' story, his hot takes, his insults, and his words of wisdom. I bring you Amos Paul Kennedy Jr. Because 
it filled my life. And I think one reason that it fills my life with joy is because I can share the product. <clears throat> it is, for those of you who don't know, letterpress printing consists of three parts. One, making the form. Two, printing the form. And three, putting the form away. The one that takes the most energy and time is making the form. Then followed by putting the form away. The one that takes the least amount of time is actually printing. <clears throat> so you spend hours making a form, and then in 30 seconds you print it. And so to justify all the time it took to make the form, to justify all the time it took to make the form. You should print multiples. And in order to print multiples, you have to have paper. So in my shop, I have stacks of paper with nothing on it. And then I print it. I have stacks of paper with something on it. But I still have a stack of paper. And so I have to get rid of that stack of paper. And I try to sell some of them. But I find giving it away is a lot more rewarding because I have not had anyone reject something that I printed that I offered to because it's a little bit different. And I like that. And I like to think that the joy that the other press printing gives me is somehow embedded in the thing that I print. And people relate to that joy. And it sparks the joy. So I print all the time. And I give things away and I leave them to coffee shops, bookstores, and just odd places where the public is. Because letterpress printing is a democratizing process. It is something for the people. And I want to share it with the people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do in regards to my cards. Like this is one of my cards, by art. And we should buy art on every opportunity you get. Art is not the domain of the wealthy. It is the domain of humans. When you hear about a Rick Grant selling for $18 billion, that is not art. Art is what is made by the individual in your community because they want to beautify their house or have your house. It is not an investment in money, it is an investment in community. So when you have the opportunity, buy art. Buy it because you like it, or buy it simply to support that artist, because they need that sale. <laughs> Make art every day. That's for everyone. Because art is not the domain of a certain group. All of us create. Create every day. Express yourself every day. Make something. It is the making that matters, not the profit. It is the transformation that takes place inside of you because you made it that you want to foster and develop. So make something every day. Let's see. <laughs> then I gotta go into things like our leaders are just we ourselves. Because sometimes we believe 
that we need this leader, this great person. But we are the leaders. We are the ones that make the great people because we designate them as that. But all that they are is because of us. We are our leaders. We know what we want. And we should work for it. All earthly goods we have only on loan. Because that is what it is. It is a loan that we have. It is something that is handed down to our ancestors for us to protect for our descendants. We are caretakers of this planet. And we must understand. How many of you think four generations from now? How many of you know what you want your great great grandchildren the world to be like? Because that's the world that you're creating. Will it be better in this world if you've never thought about it? Give consideration to it. What is the world that you're going to leave? How is it going to affect them? Is it going to be what you really want to leave? Be satisfied with your needs, not your wants. We live in a society where wants are greater than needs. I did a, uh, I did this little thing one time when I was with some students. I asked them to list one thing that they couldn't live without. And I'm a group of 20 of them. The one thing that wasn't listed was air. The more common something is, the more important it is to you. Air is everything, so we take it for granted. But you can live at least a day without your phone. But you, <laughs> but you can't live 10 minutes without air. These are our needs. Our wants can be manipulated can be created. When I was 35, I didn't want a phone, a cell phone. It didn't exist. It had to be created. So that want was created. So it could be so. Our needs are not on the marketplace, but our wants are. So give consideration to what you need and not what you want. This is a variation. Progress brings its own problem. I spent some time in corporate America, and one of the things I did, I was tech support for a sales organization. And the client would come, we would visit the client, find out what the problem was, and come up with a solution. So clients would get where I have to see this. And I started telling them that I'm only solving this problem, but the solution to the problem you have is going to come and come. We don't recognize that what we think is problem brings problems unique that didn't exist. So is it progress? As the poet said, all change is not progress. Sometimes we make change is not have a problem. This is another one. Whatever we do, whatever we do, affects, uh, every, what, whatever we do affects everything in the universe. We sometimes forget that that is the truth. We 
Have you ever heard the expression, this is a history-making moment? When, what moment does it make history? The question is, what kind of history is it making? Is it making history for a better world for your great, great, great grandchildren? Or is it going to make it worse for them? Everything you do makes history for your descendants. What kind of history are you making? Should be the question. And your answer will be, I want to make a good history. What makes a good history? We have to question that. Does acquiring more make a good history? Because this planet is limited. We will exhaust it before we exhaust our wants. But it can sustain our needs. So what are you doing? How are you affecting the universe? I like turning things like this at uh, apparitions, proverbs, just saying that here on the street. Because there's so much wisdom in it. If they've existed for a long time. So I enjoy doing that. And I enjoy sharing it with people. They say, oh, that is. He's a social printer. He's an advocate for social justice. We are all advocates for social justice. I am not unique. We all attempt to change the world in the vision that we want. But for some reason, civil, this civilization has that only certain people do it. But everyone does it. Claim your right for the world that you want to exist to exist. It has just as much right as anyone else's. Because most of us want to live a life of a unstressful life. We want to live a calm life. We're not looking for a lot of agitation. There will be agitation just because of the nature of the environment. But we're not looking for trouble. Not even good trouble. We're looking for calm, for rest. We should live, I believe, and that is what I print, that you should live a world that you are comfortable with, so everyone else can live a world that is comfortable. Now, what makes a comfortable world? At this point in my life, I say, if it makes you happy, and it doesn't harm anyone else, then all is good. Because you don't want anyone to harm you. Because that's just the nature of our beast. We don't want to feel pain. So why do we want to inflict pain? We don't want to suffer injustice. So why, do we, why should we inflict injustice? Live the life that you want to live. This is what I think. This is one that I really like. If you wish someone to keep a secret, keep it first yourself. Because as once you told the secret to someone, it's no longer a secret. And it's just a little saying that I came across. Because as I say, one thing I do is I read a lot of aphorisms and things and think of that nature. Okay. Okay, I don't worry about that. <laughs> so uh, this is what I do. I have fun. I go to my shop.
N I There we go. Oh, oh. Uh, how does that suddenly 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 have changed? Now I have your attention. <laughs> no, it's not too loud. I can hear myself. <laughs> uh, I go to my shop just about every day, and I print. Some days, but other days, I have to maintain the shop and clean up and put things away. But every day is spent somehow in, every day is spent somehow in my shop doing what I love. And I really want everyone else to be in their shop doing what they love. I have a, I have a thought that it is easier to live in a world full of happy people than it is to live in a world with a few happy people. And everyone should be happy. Everyone should find that happy place, a happy space, and be there. All the time. It shouldn't be something that I'm going to the restaurant to have a happy time. It should just be in the presence of yourself. And you want to spread that happiness to other people. You want to infect them with your happiness. Because that's what I want to do. You know, I really want people to enjoy themselves, to have less struggle. So, I've been here for two and a half days, and we had a workshop down in North Branch, in Branchburg, New Jersey, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we didn't have any kids, so it was all adults, so it was different for me. But, you know, it was interesting to see how they started to loosen up. How uh, to, um, some of them became very, for lack of a better term, stiff, a little afraid. But when they started printing and they started seeing what could be done and that nothing could go wrong, it was just another form of beauty. You know, it became extremely enjoyable. And everyone walked away with something that they could share. And that's one of the things I like to do is I like to have people walk away with things that they can share. But right now I like to take some questions because I respond better to questions than just blabbering. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, well, actually, I'd just like to know a little bit more about your progression into printing uh, this later poster style that's become your signature. Well, that came about because I was in Alabama and had a commission, and I was working on it, and I looked up. And I had a misspelled word, and I had no more paper. And so I tell people, like a good doctor, I decided I would bury my mistake. And I did consciously say, I am going to print over that mistake enough time that it doesn't stick out. And that's how I started doing the layering. And it was fun for a little while. But then one day, I said, instead of just layering, I want to make the layers intentional. So I started doing a series of posters. And one of the first ones I did was coffee. And so I had a layer with all the countries where coffee comes from. I had a layer of all the different coffee drinks. I had, you know, so each layer, reinforce the text that was on top. And that's where I am now when I do layering of text. It's interconnected. 
Yes. Each layer is standalone as a list. But they're there. And also, I like the layer because if you ever had that experience where you look at someone and you say, like it's the first time you've ever seen them, although you may have been there all your life, like maybe your parent, and it's like something, oh, who is this person? It's that news. I would like to think that people have my posters in their house for years, and suddenly they walk and the light hits a certain way, and they turn their head a certain way, and they look and they say, I've never seen that word before. It's all new. I would like for them to have that kind of experience with my work. That was a layered response. I'm sorry? That was a layered response. <laughs> <laughs> well, life is kind of layered in many respects. I got another question. Though. Yes. Um, I'm going to run this around. Okay. Oh, look. Oprah! Hey, you're in. So, um, I noticed you use different typefaces. I'm looking at your community building is art piece right there. Right. And then you have, for the first two lines, your vowels are thin, and then you have bold text. Um, what is your, is there a reason behind that? Is there an approach that you take for that? Or, you know, how do you come to those decisions along the way of what fonts and typefaces you use? Okay. <laughs> uh, in this case, and I think in all cases, the thing is, is that from the from my uh, apprenticeship in the South, I guess that's what you would call it, the ten years I spent in the South, I spent in what would very would would be called an economically oppressed area, basically in area where there was a lot of poverty. And one of the things I learned there is you use what you have and what you want. And that creates a whole degree of freedom for you. In the case of that poster, the reason why all the vowels are narrow is because we didn't have the vowels in the size of the rest of the type. <laughs> and so that's why. And so I consciously made a decision to make all the vowels narrow and the content big. And a lot of times, printers would do that. You will find, if you start to study letterpress printing, you'll see where they will use a three for an E because they ran out of an E. You know, I have a case where I could use a V a capital V for a capital A because your mind reads it as an A, despite the fact that it's a V. So it's, that's what that's the reason. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is not not a, this is not a college class. Okay. <laughs> I expect some questions, you know. Could I go to university and they just sit there like, is it over with yet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just a practical question around the shop. So they don't make type anymore, do they? I mean, where do you get your resources at this point in time with that kind of, I mean, I used to work for a printer. Right, okay. So, I'm, and we were doing lead, not the old wood parts, but it was my experience even then, that was probably 30 years ago, that that stuff is hard to find. So, just as a practical guy, uh -huh. where do you go? Okay, uh, where do I get my cut from? Well, it's still out there. It's hard as heck to find. 
And um, so you get it wherever you find it. Sometimes you can find it in um, antique stores or resale shops. And a piece of type may be $4 just for one piece of type. And I tell people it ain't going to get no cheaper. So buy it. And then you have this collection of what I call orphan type. Sometimes I get lucky, and when I was younger, I would take the back roads. And there was a town of at least, at the time, a town of 2,000 people. There was a newspaper and a print shop. And that building was owned by the people. So they just put it all in the back. And so sometimes they got lucky and I was fine to that way. But I've been collecting type now for almost 30 years. So it was a lot easier 30 years ago than it is now. So I was fortunate. And I collected a lot of it. So I'm, you know, I'm able to use it. There is a place called Virgin Wood Type in Rochester, New York. They make type but they don't make it the way that it once was. You can't call them on Monday and get a font on Friday. It may take a couple of weeks for them to cut it. Because the demand just isn't there. They don't have an inventory. So it's still available that way. There are people who are cutting tight with a laser engraver. So they are doing that. Was that? Typesetting. Yeah, typesetting, yes. For like commercial books and things like that. But the things I do, they cut they will still cut with laser engravers. Who, who else is doing this? Oh, so many people. Really? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's way too popular. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, when it comes to posters. Uh, there is an organization called Tribune uh, Show Card in Muncie, Indiana. And it's run by a couple of people in their 30s. And that business has been around for more than 120 years. And they bought it, I think, about 10 years ago from the last owner. But they continue to make posters like this, and they make them for carnivals. Like traveling carnivals that go around, they make them for that. And so they make a hundred posters for a carnival, say in April. Then in May, the carnival lasts for another hundred. So during the carnival season, they're extremely busy. Then there's Hatch Show Card in Nashville, Tennessee. And they've been around for not as many years as Tribune. They make posters for the Ryman Theater and for Country Western and popular singers, popular musicians. So the most of those have images in them besides words. Yes. I see no images. You don't. Oh! Oh! I mean, see no images. Uh, oh, boy. There we go. See this? That is the image of the sound men. That is our symbol of sound. That is the image. <laughs> yeah, but that is a simple thing, images. But I know what you're saying. I know what you're talking about. But I'm going to act like I know <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. I am a text based person. Now, I love the letters. I love the way they look. I love the way you can manipulate them. So I don't use a lot of images. And when I do use images, which I've been doing recently, I don't know if I have them here. Yeah, here's one. No, oh, here's the better one. So there was one that looked like a quilt. So my images begin to look yeah. like this. So I do these very simplistic images that are found in every culture. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know my job, you want money. Yeah, yeah but those images are found in every culture around the world. 
the circle, the triangle, the square. So I use those very, I like the word primitive, because primitive and pristine have like the same root. And we think of pristine, you know, it's like that beginning. Yes? Do you take on apprentices? Do you have people that apprentices? No, I don't. Uh, I don't believe, okay, I don't take on apprentices. I don't know if I phrase it. Yeah, I know what you mean. People can come to my shop and print, but you can't be my apprentice. Because that means that I have to have a plan to do something with you. And that interferes with my life. Okay? My plan is to go to my shop and hang out and do something. But if you're there as an apprentice, you're like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. That isn't why I that part of my day. So I do have people who come to my shop and print. And I tell people, you come to my shop at 9 o'clock in the morning. And by 1 o'clock, you have 100 posters. Because I'll take time to show you how to do it, help you set it up. And if you come back the next day, you have another hundred posters that I take time. I take a little less time. And after about a week, you're kind of on your own. Because you know the rudiments of printing. And now all you have to do is practice. It took me a long time to realize that life is really simple. It's about experience. But you gotta live in experience. It doesn't come with you when you're born. And so it's about giving people the opportunity to have the experience that I'm interested in. Not about apprentice and that's okay. So you take informal apprentices. Just don't call them that. Yeah, don't call them that. I take people who want to become my friend. You know, people who want to have fun. But more importantly, I like to take parents to bring their kids because, again, it's about that experience. I believe every child should have the opportunity to experience as much as they can so they can make the decisions as to what they want. If a child never sees a printer, they don't know if they want to be one. If a child never sees a tool or diving, they don't know if they want to be one. And we silo our children. We don't give them that expanse. And that's what I really believe that needs to happen. Children need these experiences. So, any more questions? Yes? Okay, so I have a, a few, but I'm only gonna say one. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you think is the untapped potential of letterpress printing? Like, do you see it um, being utilized in different ways or any innovative ways you see it be, uh, or it could be used? I can tell you when people come to my shop, they, a lot of people come with a question, can I do this? So right there, you know, I think it's tapped their imagination. I want to do something that I don't know if I can do. And they ask me. And I tell them, I don't know, let's try it. But <clears throat> I think that the untapped potential of letterpress 
is the same as the untapped potential of life. It is teaching people to question and seek answers on their own. That is what I see. And I don't know if that answers your question. You may like, does it have the ability to bring about liberation to the masses and that sort of thing? Yes, because if it creates questioning, imagination, then that will bring about the liberation. Because the liberation is within our mind. Free your mind and your ass will follow. As Paul the Pompadelic said. You know. And again, the way that education is in this country is we stifle that creativity in children, which is natural. Many times you hear people say, you just not have to learn how to think like a child and act like a child to adults. You know, be creative because we taught not to be creative. We taught how to take tests. We taught how to have a specific outcome, not to enjoy the process, to look for new ways of explaining or understanding. Yes. <laughs> I need more. Hey, you want to go have a cup of coffee? You can leave them behind. <laughs> Um, how has your work been received by um, artistic and um, printing communities over the years? Well, it's really interesting because when I started printing, I was like almost 40, and the people I hung out with were like 60s and 70s. But it was just have to have a young person around. You know, because the thing is, is when you absolutely and truly love something, you want it to continue. You want to know that someone is going to pick up that torch here. And so they were very happy with it. Uh, I got an issue with the art, OK? Uh, I really don't believe in it. I believe it is a way of excluding people more than including people. So I don't really deal with what we call the art world. I, uh, I like to, I consciously attempt to deal with what you would call the common person, the everyday person that Sly Stone talks about because we're everyday people, you know. It is not, for me, the art world is kind of about ego. And um, ego gets in the way for me. Other people live with it, but for me it's a deterrent. So I just like to let them have their world. Yes. Hello. Um, do you ever, my name's Adia, um, do you ever think about making a class about printing? Like, do you ever think about teaching children about printing? Or? I, uh, I like to say no, I like to corrupt children. <laughs> Corruption is better than teaching. Well, Socrates corrupted and he threw the him out. I do enjoy working with children. And with every opportunity I get to do a demo in a school, I take it. Because again, it's about letting children have that experience. But now, you can't do that. Because it's not on the test. You know, you just can't call up a teacher and say, can I come and do this workshop? I don't have time. So it becomes very difficult these days. But I do have parents or adults who bring their children. And 
we have to learn. I am thinking at the front line, you could bring a whole bunch of kids down. Not a whole bunch, but you know, 10. 40. 40? In that space? The fire marshal didn't come get you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because you should see how a child's eyes light up when you give them a blank sheet of paper and you put it on the press and they run the roll of the press and then there's these words on it. They just go, oh, it's exciting. It's, it's uh, affirming to you that you know, there is beauty in this world. So every opportunity I get, you know, I work with those kids, children, and adults. You did? Just because we're on the subject of children, have there been any children in your life that you were able to teach um, and they've kind of, you know, been inspired by your career, or not career, but your life and what you've created? Uh, I like to tell the story of a friend of mine who brought her two nieces to print with me. And I was standing in the driveway as she drove up. And one niece was about 13. And there was nothing on her face that said she wanted to be there. And she just was like, why am I here? I don't want to be here. And her sister was about 10, and she was like, it's a freedom I'm gonna have. And uh, by the end of the day, the 13-year-old was happy. She loved what she printed. She printed something, she loved it. And I looked at her and said, you didn't want to come here, did you? And she got, she, she said, yeah, I did. I said, see, you made a judgment. Always look for the best. And other, other children, like in their 20s, because that's a child to me. <laughs> you know, they have that experience. Everybody has the capability of having that experience, to experience wonder. And as adults, sometimes we forget that we can experience wonder. And we should seek every opportunity to experience wonder. so much. You know, I don't, know, I don't know if you remember, but you actually sent us announcements for it that you printed out and then I passed out to people. Oh, what, what was that? What city? It, pardon me? What city? This city. Wow. It, was, it, it was in New Jersey. Okay. And uh, we, we all did uh, prints and artwork for, about health care reform. Okay. And um, anyway, it was really wonderful experience. <laughs> but your work, your work's beautiful. We love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you for your work. Yeah, okay. I, I have a tendency. I have a tendency to uh, not know what, not know what I do. So I probably did it, but it was just doing it, and then I forgot about it. You know, because again, it's like we live in a society where everybody wants to get credit for whatever happened, and. Uh, I come from, my father was the kind of person that, he was a very modest man. And I remember him telling me, he was the head of the chemistry department, and he told me one day that being head of the chemistry department, he approaches it that he's the moon, and the faculty is the sun. The brighter they shine, the brighter he shines. And so, the more I can help an organization like that, like yours, the better it is for me. You know, because when you get down to it, helping 
other people. It's, it's a skill that we all need to cultivate. To be able to assist, to be able to get out of the way and provide people what they need is really, really important. Okay, so I have all these cards, and everybody who asks me a question, get it up. If you're not a big question, you can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, actually, everyone can have two or three, but make sure everybody at least gets one. Okay. All right, so where are we going to put them? Oh, no. <laughs> you can pass them out. <laughs> Uh, I'll get off this guy. I think I'm going to take some. You might need to Yeah, here we go. Go here. And then you just go around and keep coming Okay, there you go. Everybody. There's more, so. Okay, look around and find the ones you want. Is this a good way to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, no. You're just challenging me. Uh, I have a question, Amos. Yes. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about what you're up to with your pile of bricks in Detroit that you're going back to. Oh, no. Sorry. I'm a pile of bricks. <laughs> uh, seven years ago, eight years ago, I bought a building in Detroit that a friend of mine said was just a pile of bricks because there was four brick walls and no roof. But this is what happens when we have no imagination. You know, the walls were good, and they say the bones were good. So I put a roof on it, I put a floor in it, I put some windows in it, I put a bathroom in it. <laughs> I did all these things. And then I moved it. <laughs> and I moved from a 2,000 square foot building to a 3,000 square foot building. And I'm still a thousand feet short. A thousand square feet short. So right now I'm in the process of organizing all the junk I have in there so it can fit comfortably. Now once that's done, well not even now, once it's done, you know, people can come and print with me. Because I really, you know, if you want to print, you should have the opportunity to. You should try it if you want to. There should be some place to try it. Because it's, it's what makes me happy. It may not make you happy, but you won't know until you try it. And how many times have you heard people say, if only I had done it. If only I had the chance. Well, I don't want to be the person who didn't give somebody a chance to drink. So that's what that's about. Just giving people a chance. I have a question from Kat, who's tuning in virtually, and she wants to know how many presses you're fitting in that 3,000 square feet. 13. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> How many more do you want? <laughs> Actually, no more. <laughs> I've reached my, you know, I've reached my limit. Uh, yeah. So one of the problems with letterpress printing is that, as you said, it vanished. And what vanishes a part of Americana, a part of our history. And you know, and as a noble person, I felt I should save it. But when you're saving two ton presses, you know, it gets a little difficult. It's not the same thing as stamps, you know? So uh, I've reached the point where I've saved everything I can save. And um, it's really sad because what we don't realize is that when we tear down something, when we throw away something, it is not just that object throw away. We throw away all the energy that was required to make that object. So it multiplies. And these machines 
were meant to run for almost ever. And the way that we use them in this new generation, they put, because we don't run 16 hours a day, six days a week, maybe two hours a day. <laughs> so we spend a lot of time talking about recycling, but we don't spend any time talking about reuse. We need to start to reuse things. Yeah, my press can do, if I knew how to run it, could do like a thousand impressions an hour. Why do I need 10,000 impressions? You know? So, are there, there's cases where we only need a thousand impressions an hour. We should have those machines and use them. So, yeah. Yes? No, are we interrupting? Okay. I'm sorry? I thought we were interrupting. No, no, I, I, I thought you had a question. But you know what? If someone has the do more art, you could just pass that along over here. Whoa! But you know, you, you have to read the letter all the way through. 
But someone's got a clue. And when you send someone a letter, a card, a handwritten note, it becomes this extremely personal act that you experience and the receiver experiences. My grandfather used to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what you did wrong. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that Amos mail is my favorite mail that I ever get in my letterbox. So, he even prints the envelopes. Well, I should have had right now, but they fall a lot. And I'd rather print. <laughs> you know, seriously, you know, I really like printing. It's so much fun for me. It is. What's that? Uh, I, I print the envelope. Yeah, I will print messages on the envelope. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. 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 That's for me. So, you know, uh, you know, I think I printed, oh, you know, I print things like save the comments. You know, things, you know, just think that the post. How many of you know your post, what, your postal carrier thing? Yeah. Yeah. Your carrier thing, the letter carrier. Okay. Yeah, I mean, here is someone who comes to your house every day, whether they have something or not here. They pass by. Every day. They know the community better than people who live in the community. So I like to put something on it for them. You know, oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's cute. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if uh, you don't want me to ask this, but if anyone wants to join your secret special club, or if anyone wants to get any of your work or find you, how can they do that? How does somebody have to die and be That's right. <laughs> That's how exclusive that part. Yeah. So the time everybody can get on, but nobody wanted to be on it. So I was like, okay, I got five people on it. You're not waiting for one of them to die. <laughs> and the oldest one is 25. <laughs> uh, so, The only thing that I do with the same intensity as I print is not run a business. I'm really bad at running a business. I have no desire. <clears throat> so in 2024, I am, well, I'm already started. I don't take orders over the internet. I only want to sell through stores. And the reason I want to sell through stores is because they pay local taxes that go in through the services that people in that community get. So that's it. <coughs> so that's what I'm doing in 2024. And I will only sell through one store in the zip code. I'm not interested in having 5,000 stores. So, and I, I hope they get frontline care for stuff in New Jersey, but they have such a long wait list. <laughs> I gotta wait for somebody to not get on it. <laughs> uh, but I, I do have a subscription service, and <clears throat> it was, um, I kind of capped it at 250 because it was a nice number. Actually, I kept it at 240 because the mailing labels count like 30 to a set. I wanted to use the whole page. I didn't want to have half a page. So I have to do increments of 30. So I'm thinking about opening it back up 
for between now and uh, the first of the year. Because a lot of people have asked. And it's uh, for $120, you get 13 cards. It's a five dollars a thing that does it. And um, I have to raise the price. Wait, no, it's $150. <laughs> I raised the price. But <clears throat> people who got off my thing back in 2020, it was $120. So it'll always be $120 for them, unless they get off. Then it goes back to whatever the price is. Because um, the price of stuff goes up. But if you supported me when I had nothing, then the least I can do is support you when I have even less. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I'm having a hard time, you're probably having a hard time. And, you know, I can, I'm used to living with hard times, kind of. So, um, I may start that. I'm on Instagram at Kennedy Prince. And if I do that, I'll probably announce it the first of December and open it up. And so, I have to close it at the end of December so I can start processing and getting the cards out. Because sometimes the pandemic kind of messed with me. So it was only supposed to be a year, but it went for like two years. And I know, I don't know how many I sent, but I know I sent more than 13, which I promised. Just because I promised 13 doesn't mean you won't get 14. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the base, that's the bottom. And the top is, depending on what postage you see on. Because I think for another 13th, then you can add an ounce. But I may stick two. Just because I can. It's nice to be able to do things because you can. We wanted to get you water. <laughs> she likes some soda. <laughs> well, we're, we've only got about uh, nine more minutes here. Um, so I'll open it up for any final questions. But if not. There's still cards left. Yes. yes. Please I take some more. You have friends. You have friends. Give me 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 and I just want to thank everyone so much for coming out tonight. Um, please remember to grab your car by 8 p.m. or you will not have a car. <laughs> for those online, thank you so much for tuning in as well. Um, Amos, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. It has been such a pleasure this week. He even got us bagels and buttered our presses. It's been wild. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes. All right, everyone. Thanks so much, Kennedy Prince. <laughs>